I'm in the new space. It's gonna take a while for me to get things in order. I have no idea what's happening, what it sounds like in here, what any of this looks like. We'll figure it out together. Hi guys, welcome back. If you are new here, hello. Welcome to my new space. My name is Sarah and what I do here is tell you a terrible story to ruin your day and put on my makeup at the same time. If you're into that combination, then you are in the right place. So make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any of my uploads. I'm realizing that I did not do my intro properly. I'm out of practice. Spoiler alert for the makeup look. Crew time. 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 Today's story comes from one of the four states in the United States where billboards are illegal. I guess it's like considered too pretty of a place to junk it up with like advertisements and road signs. It's the home of Ben and Jerry's ice cream and the nation's largest producer of maple syrup. Syrup? Syrup? Sizzurp. Ooh, also all of the outside town scenes from the movie Beetlejuice were filmed there. If I get started talking about Beetlejuice, we're never gonna get to the story, so moving on. It's Vermont. Today's story was recommended by a viewer here on YouTube named Maria Redpath. Thank you so much, Maria. I appreciate you. This is the story of Jody Herring. Okay. Here we go. On August 7th, 2015 at 4.45 p.m., former Washington County State's Attorney Greg McNaughton was waiting for his friend Andy Hockman in a parking lot near the Department for Children and Families, DCF, building in Barrie, Vermont. Just after 5 p.m., he heard a loud gunshot and then yelling and then a second gunshot. He took cover behind his truck and then looked across the parking lot where he saw a woman with blonde hair holding a long gun. He ran into the nearby Jerry's Sports Tavern and yelled for them to call 911. When he stepped back outside, he saw the current state's attorney, Scott Williams, near the woman talking to her. Then his friend Andy arrived and also made his way over to the woman. And Scott Williams was yelling, don't let her leave. The three men approached this woman. Greg put his hand on her left wrist and Andy had his hand on her right arm. She took like a small step, but didn't try to run or anything. And they kept her right there. You know, at some point the woman had been disarmed. You know, either she laid down the gun or they took it from her, but either way, the gun was on the ground. And lying at the woman's feet was a female victim. The shooter was Jody Herring, and the woman lying on the ground was a DCF caseworker named Laura Sobel. How did we get here? I'm glad you asked. Jody Lynn Herring was born on September 11th, 1974 to Janella and David Herring near Barrie, Vermont. Her father, David, grew up in a very abusive home. He grew up on a thousand acre farm on the Dog River near Mount Pillar called Happy Acre Farm, <laughs> ironic. And he was one of 16 children. Now it's alleged, although not contested at all, that David's father, Frank, severely abused those children. He locked them in closets, he beat them, and he raped them at gunpoint. So everyone in the family agrees on this part that David was absolutely the one that would bear the worst of his father's brutality. He once tied David to a tree and then threw pitchforks at him. Years later, when David passed away, the county medical examiner thought that maybe he had been like a POW, prisoner of war at some point because of the amount of scars on his body. You get it. Physical, mental, sexual abuse ran deep in that family. Also, most everyone agrees that David turned into an abusive person also. He was physically abusive to his wife and son, you know, just continuing that cycle of violence, but he did cherish his daughter, Jody. So when Jody was only five years old, David was found dead in the front yard, having suffered a gunshot wound to the head. Now, being only five years old at the time, who knows how much of it Jody really understood, but she was crushed by his death even though she did witness all of the abuses that her mom and brother Dwayne suffered. Now here's the really weird thing though about that gunshot. David 
was left-handed, and the entrance wound was on the right side of his head, and the gun was found in his right hand. Also, it seems pretty unrealistic that he would commit suicide in broad daylight in the front yard. Also, when he was home alone with his young five-year-old daughter. Another thing, too, is that David said that he had been receiving threats in the weeks leading up to his death, and he even shared that information with many of his family members. He had started sleeping with a gun under his pillow. Well, despite all of this, um, David's death was ruled a suicide, although the family to this day disagrees. So, after this incredible loss and trauma, Jody started suffering seizures, and they went untreated. She would stare off into the distance, like just zoning out, staring into space for hours at a time. She wasn't aware of anybody or anything around her. I mean, you could wave your hand in front of her and she wouldn't blink or anything. She just kind of stared. Hours! Her aunts and cousins would comment on this, but her mom just said it was just her way of coping with her father's death. No treatment was sought at all. So apparently her mom, Janella, was, I don't know, salty about Jody being spared the abuse from her late husband. And when Janella later remarried, she became abusive to the kids also. Jody and Dwayne were beaten daily and eventually they were kicked out. Jody was 11 and Dwayne was 14. Like what were they supposed to do? It's not like they could get jobs or rent an apartment. So on their own, they were destitute. They slept in abandoned cars and empty houses when they could. They had to steal if they wanted to eat anything. They ended up staying with the grandparents for some of that time and you can imagine how bad it was if they were gonna go to like that abusive household. So they bounced around other family members' houses. Remember, the dad came from a family of 16, so it was a big group, but even so, there wasn't a lot of stability. At age 17, Jody was sexually assaulted by a stranger or maybe it's just somebody she didn't want to reveal the identity of. She became pregnant and she kept the child at 17. Ugh. Jody went on to have two more children over the years, but you know, her situation never really improved. She was still suffering from those seizures and she was abusing alcohol and street drugs. She later became addicted to prescription medications. So, you know, largely homeless with three young kids, untreated medical conditions, drug addiction, and worsening mental illness. Things were bad. Unsurprisingly, she had trouble with the law, family, and criminal court. So listen, if you're put on the streets at age 11, you're gonna learn to do what you gotta do to survive. Here's the thing, there wasn't any like recovery or redemption. The thing about Jody was that on top of all this terrible stuff that she'd gone through in her life, she was an asshole. Sorry, it's true. She wasn't somebody who was seeking to improve her situation or you know, try to make a better life for herself and her children. She was like hella entitled. She was a taker. And you know, people are gonna hate that I said that and I'm not trying to be a victim blamer, but just wait, okay? Just wait till you hear the rest. So Jody's rap sheet was long and it started back in like the mid 90s. The total of misdemeanors that she had convictions on was like 11. And remember, some of those convictions resulted um, from plea deals, so the original crimes were more serious. For example, a felony larceny charge from a jewelry store theft in December 2001 was pled down to a misdemeanor with restitution ordered, but she failed to appear in court. And this happened like a total of 10 times, but they just kept cutting her break after break after break because of her background and her family situation. In April of 2003, the police had some probable cause, I guess, and stopped Jody and her brother Dwayne when they were driving. They found 42 baggies of heroin hidden inside her body. You know where. She was sent to court-ordered rehab in May, but then failed to appear at a court appearance in June, so the judge issued a warrant for her arrest. Jody went on the run, and she was gone missing, you know, for like a year before they found her and arrested her. But even after all that, she signed a plea agreement to reduce that heroin charge to a misdemeanor plus probation. Then what did she do? Violate probation, signing another agreement for more probation, and on and on and on. I mean, this woman. And like I said, like as a troubled young kid, you can understand, but like after years and years of this and having three children to support, like girl, get your shit together. So we're kind of jumping around in the timeline of like, 
her record and stuff, but like the pattern, is j it just is there. In 1998, she was disqualified from owning a firearm as part of a proceeding in family court. And when she was arrested for the crimes of today's story, spoiler alert, she had pending DUI charges. Jody was a frequent flyer with the legal system, and it seems like they were really trying to work with her, you know? Most of the time, she wasn't getting sentenced to, like, jail time, so her three kids were still in her care, I mean, in the beginning at least. DCF, you know, the social services, they tried really hard to help her and they offered programs and care. She was never really able to hold down a steady job because of her behavior issues, both drug abuse and untreated mental illness. Now, Jody's aunts, um, mostly her two aunts, Rhonda and Regina, were by all accounts trying everything that they could to help Jody, particularly with the children. So these two aunts, although they'd never made it past high school, they avoided most of the family's, like, larger troubles. Now, despite going to rehab several times, Jody was severely addicted to alcohol and prescription medication. She was also very, very paranoid. I mean, untreated mental illness and addiction sure doesn't help, but basically she was terrified of being sober and trusted no one. Okay, so anytime that Jody's aunts would try to step in, like offer to let her kids come stay with them, you know, because they were homeless, or, you know, maybe they saw Jody high out of her mind, you know, and they're just trying to help give the kids some stability, right? Well, Jody viewed that as like, like a conspiracy to undermine the relationship, her relationship with the kids, or even that they were scheming to like take her kids away. Also, as you may have guessed, Jody had a string of terrible boyfriends. They were abusive, druggy criminals, but these men would give her and her kids a place to live you know, for a short time anyway. Now, over time, DCF finally lost patience with Jody and the kids were removed from her care one by one. So in the years leading up to this particular event, Jody actually had found a really good guy. His name was Henry Premont. He had a legitimate job and he cared about Jody. You know, he wanted to see her get her life together. He wanted to help her and he let her and the kids stay with him even when things in their relationship were rocky. Henry Premont would later testify that he loved Jody and the kids, but Jody's drinking and drug use just was too much for him. He had talked with her about it many times and she had promised to change and get help, but she never did. Now, when they were together, Jody only had custody of one of her kids, the youngest one who was nine years old at the time. At a certain point, Henry just reached, you know, the end of his rope and he finally asked Jody to leave. So when Jody moved out, she stayed on a relative's couch for a bit until she can get an apartment for her and her daughter, but the calm didn't last long at all. Of course, Jody was still drinking and was severely depressed as she had been most of her life, but more so lately. The teachers and the counselors at her daughter's school were aware of Jody's troubled life and started to get really concerned about the care that Jody was able to provide for her daughter, and they started to intervene. So the principal of the school met with Jody and it didn't go well at all. Jody was like unclear and hard to understand and it wasn't obvious whether it was because she was like mentally unwell or just high. Well, since the principal had a duty to protect one of their students. We are mandated reporters, so we need to call. If we have a concern, she called DCF. Now, this was definitely not the first time that a call had been made about Jody's parenting. Remember, she'd already lost custody of two of her three children. Well, DCF moved forward on removing the third child. And, you know, to be clear, the goal of child services, you know, CPS, DCF, whatever acronym they use. Their aim is to reunite families. They want to help struggling people get the tools they need to create a healthy and safe environment for kids. They're not the bad guys. But anyways, after having the last of her kids removed, 41-year-old Jody was despondent. She was already a mess, but it was so bad that her aunts got really worried. 
Her cousin Tiffany and aunts Rhonda and Regina all reached out to see if there was anything they could do to help. And remember, Jody is very suspicious of her family and she was convinced that they had initiated the contact with DCF. I mean, she knew that it was the school principal who called, but it must have been at their insistence. And Jody was very, very, very vocal about this. Even so, they knew Jody was in crisis and they called 911 to conduct a wellness check. When EMS arrived on the scene, they found Jody passed out from an overdose from prescription drugs and alcohol, very likely a suicide attempt. When they found her, she was lying on her bed surrounded by photos of the kids. Well, luckily, the emergency responders had got there in time to save her, and Jody was checked into a rehab center for a 90-day stay, recommended 90 days. Now, unfortunately, after about 30 days, Jody had enough and wanted to leave. And since it was voluntary, there was nothing they could do to keep her. Jody's oldest daughter, by this time she's an adult. She was like 21 years old. Well, hang on a second. The math isn't mathing. Did I say Jody was 41? Whatever. She would have been 38, 40. Anyways, okay, the oldest daughter was an adult and, and Jody was, I think, 41. Right, okay. Anyways, her oldest daughter, Desiree, she was sadly following in her mother's footsteps. You know, she had multiple arrests through her young life, drug and alcohol problems, and, you know, many periods of homelessness. Very much like her mom, Desiree would fail to appear in court and violated probation, ending up in jail. Desiree also had a young son that was removed by DCF. Apparently, Jody had tried to step in to take custody of the boy, but she was such a disaster. They were like, uh... No. Well, the caseworker that removed Desiree's son from her custody was Lara Sobel. Lara Kim Sobel was born in Oceanside, New York, and she was a married mother of two daughters. She was a generous and caring woman. She graduated from the University of Vermont with a bachelor's degree in political science in 1989, and then she got her master's degree in social work in 2002. After being employed by the Department of Children and Family Services, DCF, in Barrie, Vermont, she met Timothy Farinas, and they fell in love, and they got married, and then they had the two daughters together, Julia and Alana. Laura was a wonderful mom, and she believed in helping those around her. She loved her work, and she was described as a pit bull of an advocate for kids. She was like pretty much the exact right person to be in that line of work. So according to witnesses, Jody showed up at the DCF building in Barrie, Vermont on August 7th, 2015 at 4.30 and waited inside her car, screaming either to herself or to somebody on the phone. When Laura exited the building, she was talking on the phone to her daughter and Jody got out of her car and approached her and then shot her in the neck. After Laura fell to the ground, Jody shot her again at close range in the head. She was screaming and yelling. They knew what they were doing. They got what they deserved. After that, she just kind of stopped and waited, you know? She didn't try to shoot anybody else or to run away. And when the police came, she was taken into custody without further incident. While Jody is being booked at the police station in Barrie, on the other side of town, Jody's cousin Tiffany was trying to reach her mom, Rhonda, Jody's aunt. She would later recall that when she was at her mom's house earlier that day, she she heard a voicemail that was left from Jody that said, You might want to stop fucking calling DCF or I'm going to come and shoot your brains out. She threatened. I mean, while that's insane considering, you know, what just happened at the DCF building, it was actually pretty normal for Jody to threaten her family. In fact, it was so normal that Jody's own daughter, Desiree, would later testify that her mom threatened to kill her and many members of their family pretty often. Jody's brother, Dwayne, also got a voicemail from Jody that day. Actually, it was two messages, but the second one told him to watch the news. You'll wish you got a hold of me sooner. I didn't hear my phone right. 
if I'd answered my phone, my, we wouldn't be here today. Okay, so hours and hours go by and Tiffany can't get a hold of her mom, so she decided first thing in the morning to drive out to her house to go see her. When she arrived, she found the front door of the house wide open, and when she went inside, she found her 48-year-old mother, Rhonda Herring, dead. Also dead inside the house was her aunt, 43-year-old Regina Herring, and her grandmother, 73-year-old Julie Ann Falzerano. Hold on to your butts. Turns out that before Jody Herring drove to the DCF building that day, well, the day before, she had broken into her ex-boyfriend Henry's apartment and taken his bolt-action rifle. Remember, she's not allowed to buy a firearm herself. When I heard about it, I went upstairs and, and um, checked on if my rifle was there and it was missing. She then drove out to her aunt's house and shot all three family members that were there. Rhonda was in the living room. She had been shot twice in the torso. Regina was in a bedroom, also shot in the torso. And Julie was actually found lying in her bed, shot also in the torso. Rhonda Herring, dear mother of Tiffany, loved spending time with her family members, playing cards and dice and cooking. Regina Herring loved spending time with her family during the holidays, and she was very close to her nieces and nephews. Julie Falzerano loved fishing and playing cards and doing word searches and dancing. She cherished all the time that she got to spend with her daughters, and they lived together and they took care of each other. These women are the ones who were the closest to Jody, you know, the ones that tried to help her. And they're also the ones that called for help, that wellness check that ended up saving her life. Now, if the life story of Jody Herring wasn't like shit-tastic enough, let me tell you about the people who <laughs> actually support her. And I don't mean like they want her to like get her shit together and become a contributing member of a civilized society. I mean like people who think that what she did was justified. DCF isn't a flawless system, and there turns out to be many people who find them to be intrusive and malicious. It's not the state's business to interfere with how you want to raise your kids. The people who hate DCF tend to have a bad experience with DCF, aka their own kids were taken away at some point. No surprise. I'm not a parent, but also maybe don't be a shitty parent. Yeah, so there's like a whole group of kooks on the internet who like support and like cheer on Jody Herring for shooting this social worker. Gross. Not only did Jody Herring murder her family members for like being too much up in her business, she also murdered a social worker for actually doing their job. Oh, and then she was laughing about it. Oh yeah, I left that part out. Laughing at what she had done like it was no big deal. But she also went to her ex-boyfriend's sister's house that day. Unsuccessful, obviously, but like why though? Did that person call DCF on her too? No. Jody was mad at her because during that breakup, that sister sided with her brother. How unreasonable. Also, Jody was real busy that day because she was also spotted at her mother's house in the driveway waiting in her car with a gun. She must have just like lost patience and, and left. Lucky for those two people, but Jody Herring didn't shoot any of these people because she was trying to like right wrongs on society or protect her right to liberty. Jody was a deeply troubled woman and she was incapable of taking responsibility for her own actions. And that's not a hero. So when Jody was arrested in the parking lot after murdering Laura Sobel, she had been charged of course with that murder, but then the next day when her family was discovered, they quickly determined that it was the same weapon, the ballistics all matched, and the three additional murders were added. Jody pled guilty to the three counts of second degree murder for Rhonda, Regina, and Julie, and one count of first degree murder murder for the death of Laura Sobel. She was sentenced to 20 years each for the murders of her family members, and those are served concurrently. And she was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for the murder of Laura Sobel. Jody appealed that life sentence as she contended that someday she could be rehabilitated and she should have a chance for parole. The trial judge
judge stated that he thought she was just as likely to sit in jail and add up everyone who wronged her in this case and then come after them if she got parole. Quote, while the court's finding that the defendant would continue to pose a risk appears to have played some role in its decision to sentence her to life without parole, the court made clear that it was imposing this sentence because of the devastating crime committed and the toll it took on so many people. Jody's appeal was denied. Jody Herring is currently serving her sentence at the Vermont Department of Corrections in Williston, Vermont. After Laura Sobel's death, the University of Vermont awarded scholarships to both of her daughters. In her honor, Laura's parents also started a memorial scholarship fund at the University of Vermont to benefit graduate students in the social work program, a permanent endowment totaling over $97,000. And that, friends, is the story of Jody Herring. Thanks again to Maria Redpath for this terrible story recommendation. Also, if you're interested to know any of the makeup that I used in today's video, just check the description box down below. Everything is linked. Also, you'll find down there some coupon codes for some stuff I think you might like. Thank you so much for hanging out today and for watching this video. I really appreciate it. If you want to see more videos like this one, then consider subscribing to this channel before you leave today. I upload new videos here on YouTube every week and you can follow me on most of the other socials. If you have a crew triumph story recommendation that you would like to make, there is a link down in the description box to a Google document that you can complete with your recommendation. Thank you very much in advance. And I think that's it for now. I'll see you next time in the next video. Bye. Beings. Hello. Caseworker. I was, I keep wanting to say Lara. It's not Lara. regarding the um, call. No, this is not updated. Scenes from the mu- From the movie? No, this is not, this isn't it. Oh shit, I just realized I'm not ready. What are you doing? Right here. A moose. <laughs>